Hello, brothers and sisters. I'm Pastor Stephen Jurdy at Zion Lutheran Church in Wausau, Wisconsin, here to share with you a word at the middle of the week. Today we are beginning a new online study, Portraits of Mercy. Mercy is our focus here at Zion for the season of Easter. And before I do anything else, I probably should talk a little bit about what mercy is. Usually, when we talk about mercy, we think in the church of God having mercy on us for our sins and canceling our guilt and giving us forgiveness. And that certainly is one way of talking about mercy. Speaking even more broadly, mercy in Holy Scripture is any help that someone shows us when we are in a time of need. This definition of mercy was first brought to my attention by an excellent little book called Heaven on Earth, written by Arthur Just. There he talks about the prayer that we pray in worship, Lord have mercy, and reminds us that when we say, Lord have mercy, we're not just asking God to save us from our sins or to raise us from the dead. We're asking God, the King of creation, to be our helper, our deliverer, our friend, and our defender in all of our created life. So mercy is a favorite word of mine. It is, more importantly, a favorite word of God. God loves to show mercy. As he says in scripture, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And so it's one of his great regal actions to help us in time of need. So just as God has had mercy on creation by sending his son to be our helper, who saves us from our sins and who strengthens us and protects us in times of trouble, so does he send the church to practice mercy by helping our neighbor and by caring for creation. It's on that aspect of mercy that we're going to focus in this online series. And the way we're going to do it is by reaching back into history and meeting believers from times past who give us excellent examples of how to love one another, how to serve our neighbors, and how to be good stewards of this creation that God has made. Our example for today is Saint Tabitha, also called Saint Dorcas. Her name Tabitha means gazelle in Aramaic. Her name Tabitha can be translated Dorcas in Greek, and so she probably was known by both names in the early church because the early church was a church that occupied both the Aramaic-speaking world of Judea and Galilee and the Greek-speaking world of the Roman Empire. And she shows up for us in Acts chapter 9, where we read the following. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the windows stood beside, I'm sorry, all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So an amazing thing happens in that passage. Peter raised Tabitha from the dead. She has died. There are many widows gathered around her, holding the garments that she has made for them and weeping and mourning her death. And Peter, one of the apostles, and in many ways the chief apostle, comes, visits her, prays, tells her to rise. She rises, he gives her his hand, and, and pulls her up and presents her alive to the church. It's an amazing miracle. 
what I want us to see today is that it's also a lesson for us in the mercy of the church, because we learn there that one reason why the widows were mourning Tabitha is that she appears to have made tunics or outer coat-like garments and other pieces of clothing for them. To appreciate that act of mercy best, it's good to remember the time in which Tabitha lived. This was not a time where there was State Farm insurance or American Family insurance or any other kind of insurance we think of. This was a time where people worked to earn money uh, or to earn goods, perhaps, in a barter arrangement. And if you then were a widow, you did not have a husband working for you anymore. And if your husband had not gathered enough treasure for you before he died to sustain you as a widow, then you could very easily find yourselves yourself in poverty if you were one such widow. Moreover, this was not the time of Old Navy or L.L. Bean or Target or wherever people go to buy clothing. Clothing was not mass produced. In many households, you had to make your own clothing, and that means you had to secure your own material and you had to know how to sew. And so clothes were things that you probably didn't have very many items of. And you had to put out your own money, quite a bit of money perhaps, to buy just a few articles of clothing. So as a widow, clothing would be one of those items you would have to worry about. Will I have enough money to pay for my clothing? Tabitha helped care for the church by making clothing for the church's widows. There is an example of mercy, an example of someone caring for people in their poverty. It's not just that she made clothing. Certainly the church is called to clothe those who are naked, to clothe those who need protection from the element. But it's even bigger than that. It's that Tabitha is setting an example of how the church cares for people who are in poverty or who are poor in general. Uh, we in the church are to have a strong kinship with the poor. We remember, as St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Christ became poor that we may become rich. That is, Christ divested himself. He gave up his clothing of splendor as the Son of God in, in heaven, at God's right hand, in order to come and become a slave, even to the point of dying on the cross. He became poor and poured himself out so that we may be clothed with God's love and his mercy and his riches. And therefore, we see a great exchange, Christ giving up his riches to be poor, that we may, in our poverty of sin, yet be rich. So in the church, we have a kinship with the poor because we see that our God himself became poor and we understand ourselves to be poor, that we really don't own anything in this world. The world belongs to God. Whatever he gives to us, he gives us on trust to be used according to his purposes and for those good things he would have us do. And so we really own nothing in the world. If we do own possessions legally, uh, as the world understands it, it's as stewards tasked with using those possessions for good in God's merciful way. And so we look at the poor and we see ourselves. We look at the poor and we see Christ. We look at the poor and we see brothers and sisters uh, for whom we are to pour ourselves out just as Tabitha did by making clothing for the widows. And there's something more about that, this, this clothing aspect. You know, clothing has a history in the theology of the church because Clothing was the first thing that God made for Adam and Eve after they sinned. You might remember this if you know that story. Adam and Eve sinned, and when they sinned, they realized they were naked and they were ashamed. And so they took fig leaves and used fig leaves to try to cover themselves up. And God looked at that and he said, not fig leaves. And so God somehow um, sacrificed an animal, killed an animal in order to make leather clothing for them. Uh, clothing helped cover their shame after their sin. Clothing is something that we still find comfort in today uh, in this world. And so in making clothing for the widows, Tabitha wasn't only providing for them, for them in their bodily needs in a very practical way, but she also was affirming for them in a spiritual and personal way, you are beloved members of creation. 
you are honorable. You are to not be left in shame. And so that clothing becomes almost like a sacrament, a way of confirming for them that God's eye is upon them, that God's eye is upon them with favor, uh, the favor of Christ who does not look upon us in our shame, but looks upon us for the sake of his own blood shed for us. All this we learn from St. Tabitha, our first portrait of mercy here in the season of Easter. We'll have a different portrait of mercy, mercy each Wednesday, and I hope you come back each week to learn how we too may love our neighbors, love one another, and love this creation in which God has made us. Peace be with you.